In one of the previous videos, we discussed a frequentist way for model selection, where we optimize different models and then test and compare them on a separate uh, validation set. And we use the method of cross-validation to maximally make use of the available data. Now, in this video, I'm going to present a way to do model selection based on Bayesian principles, meaning uh, we stay completely in the probabilistic setting and rely on the rules of probability theory. And by doing so, we can do model selection without the need for an independent test set. And we'll compare models via the so-called model evidence, and I'll show that the model evidence naturally tends to select models that are just complex enough to model the data, but not overly complex, by which it avoids overfitting. Now, in this video, when we talk about models, we talk about the predictive distributions that we've been trying to recover so far, right? Uh, via methods such as maximum likelihood, maximum posterior, or Bayesian model averaging. So each M in this uh, talk will be one of such models. So we keep it a bit abstract, like each M is just one of those models. It's a probability distribution in itself. And now I'm going to consider multiple of such models and I indexes maybe uh, the type of basis functions that I use. For example, one model relies on Gaussian basis functions, the others on polynomials. And then we could try different orders of the polynomials. So really uh, this I index is one of all the options that I'm considering. Um, so I'm going to compare models. And before I start, maybe I would have a prior belief over my models that maybe uh, one model I believe is more appropriate than others. So that's encoded in my prior belief. Okay, so and then what we've done so far in this Bayesian setting, we want to um, sort of retrieve the posterior uh, probability for a given uh, model, given my data. So now I am having all these observations uh, on the data and I want to update my prior knowledge and that results in the posterior distribution um, for, for my models. And such posterior distributions were so far obtained via uh, Bayes rule, right? So the posterior is given by uh, the likelihood um, of my model times the prior of this model and then normalized with uh, the data evidence. Okay, so and at this point, this likelihood over here, so will be called um, the model evidence or the marginal likelihood. Uh, so I'm really considering my models at this high level where I just make some high level choices like number of basis functions, but then all the rest, all the parameters like the weights W, the priors, they are all marginalized out via a Bayesian uh, process. So really um, I'm, I'm considering here the marginal likelihood, which is really uh, the probability that this data uh, was generated via a model such as this. I'll, I'll explain a bit more in, in the next slides and also, also actually in the next video. Uh, but for now, let's just assume that we are able to come up with such a posterior probability for uh, my models given my data. And then if you want to go fully Bayesian, uh, then maybe we also want to do model averaging. So averaging over all my models using these posterior probabilities. And that would result in a predictive distribution, which uh, in which I do not select one particular uh, model, but I take the average. So I sum over uh, all my models. So each model has a particular predictive distribution associated with it. And I'm going to weight it with uh, the posterior probabilities uh, of these models, given my data. Okay, so you can already feel that this is going to be uh, become intractable quite quickly. So we cannot expect to find analytic or closed form solutions for these type of uh, distributions. And well, I guess you can get quite far if you just stick with the uh, numerical implementations and just average all your, your models uh, in some way. But really this is going to be computationally very expensive and analytically really intractable. So what people typically do, they work with approximations and really the approximation will be we're just going to select the most probable model for my predictions. And this really means that I'm going to maximize. So argmax over my models of the marginal likelihood times the prior over my models. Okay, so really I'm doing model selection here. So this, this part is model selection model selection based on the posterior distribution. Um, but often, so this posterior is, is a product of this marginal likelihood times this prior, but often 
we do not have much prior information. Often it's really hard to tell in advance which model is going to be better than others. So you then say we're going to work with a, a flat distribution, meaning that each model has the same probability, each model is equally likely. And if that's the case, if we consider a flat distribution for oh, for my prior, then this term really doesn't contribute to this optimization problem. And we're focusing entirely on maximizing um, the model evidence or the, the, the marginal likelihood. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to assume a flat prior, which means that this term really doesn't contribute to this problem. And so we're maximizing uh, the marginal likelihood. And this process is called model selection. So we select the model that maximizes this marginal likelihood. And we're going to use that in the end for our uh, predictive distribution. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to maximize the posterior for uh, my models, um, which means that we're going to compare models based on this criterion. And basically we want to see which uh, model is better than the other, so we can look at this fraction. So really the comparison that we're making is we're looking at this ratio of uh, the lo marginal likelihood times the prior for model one, model one, uh, the, over the marginal likelihood of the second model times the prior for model two. And as said before, we do not have much prior assumption. So it's hard to say if one model is better than the other. So typically we can assume that this uh, ratio between the priors is close to one. So that means that in the end, we're really interested in this ratio. And if this ratio is uh, larger than one, then it means we have a preference over uh, for model uh, one. Now, this particular ratio is called base factor. Okay, so I mentioned this in the previous slide. So really we're interested in maximizing the posterior for my models, but it turns out with um, a reasonable assumption that I have a flat prior uh, for my models, it ends up that I'm primarily interested in these terms, in the model evidence. So in the end, we're really optimizing the model evidence or the marginal likelihood, which is given as follows. And of course, this is called the marginal likelihood because we're not just considering the likelihood given my uh, model parameters, but really uh, the model parameters W's are, are, are marginalized out. So in the end, really, I have a predictive distribution um, which no longer depends on, on my model parameters. And another common name for this is the model evidence, right? So it's really the evidence or let's say the likelihood or probability that my data uh, was generated by such a model. So we call it the model evidence. Okay, now quickly looking back at, uh, I mentioned before that uh, we're not going to rely on a separate validation set to do model selection uh, as we did in a, let's call it a frequentist setting. Uh, using cross-validation, for example, but now we're really optimizing using the full data, right? So we use the full data to compute this model evidence and we're going to optimize this thing and that will in the end give us the most optimal model. Okay, so we're interested in uh, the model evidence. Now let's have a closer look. What I'm going to do next, I'm going to make some approximations to this model e evidence, making some assumptions. And by doing so, we gain some intuition of what this model evidence actually means, what it does. And it turns out that this model evidence, uh, it will favor models that are just complex enough such that it's able to, to fit the data, uh, but it won't get uh, overly complex due to some complexity penalty that, that's sort of included in this thing. Um, okay, so that's what I'm going to show. Now, first of all, I'm going to note that this thing over here is really... Um, the unnormalized, unnormalized posterior, right? The posterior was uh, the likelihood times the prior, but then normalized uh, with the data evidence, which is actually this entire integral over here. So usually to get uh, the posterior for my Ws, I normalize with the, the evidence. Okay, so this model evidence is really the normalization constant uh, for my uh, posterior. And then what I'm going to do next is I'm going to approximate this integral by assuming that the posterior is sharply peaked around the maximum posterior solution, which isn't a too weird assumption, right? Because we saw if you have more and more data that these posteriors tend to get sharper and sharper. And that also means that, that this integral will be uh, sharply peaked around the maximum posterior uh, 
a solution. And then we assume that this posterior distribution has a certain width to it. So that's indicated with uh, delta W posterior. So graphically, it's, it's something like this. So, um, okay, yeah. So I have a narrow uh, distribution with a certain width. And then I'm also going to assume that the prior is at least wider than my posterior. So it's a wide prior, uh, wide enough, such that it sort of takes it on a constant value along this uh, interval, along the width of my posterior. And I'm going to assume my uh, prior uh, to, well, I have, have the probabilities one over uh, the width, basically. So sort of uniform uh, distribution. Okay, so why am I doing this? Uh, because if I consider such a distribution, then uh, which has a certain width, so let's say uh, delta, then if I'm going to compute the integral of this thing, let's just <laughs> denote it like this. And uh, this distribution had a certain, um, it, it was centered around, well, my uh, map solution, and it has a certain height, which I'm, uh, well, now I'm going to call it uh, the probability at W map. Well, then this integral is given by uh, this area, right? The width times the height. So this integral will be approximated uh, by uh, taking the value around the maximum times the width of this uh, distribution. Okay, so that's a type of uh, uh, approximation that I'm going to do. Okay, so <laughs> that's this approximation. Uh, okay, and I'm going to apply that now to this integral, right? So I'm going to evaluate this thing which I'm integrating here at, uh, at its peak. So I'm going to fill in W map over there and over there, and I'm going to integral, uh, uh, approximate this integral via this uh, delta. Okay, so that gives me uh, the likelihood for my uh, map solution for this particular model times uh, the prior, which we assume to have uh, this value over here. So it's really dividing by the width of this uh, prior. And then times the width of my posterior distribution, right? The width of, of this thing. So that gives me times delta W posterior. All right, so really that's the approximation that we're making, right? And typically, and now we want to maximize this model evidence. And what you usually do is you maximize the log of, of, of the thing that you optimize because we saw it's super convenient uh, in most cases. And now again, because now we can now nicely separate um, this approximation into these three terms, namely uh, the log of the likelihood plus some other penalty, which depends on this fraction of the width of the posterior versus the width of uh, the prior. And it's precisely this term which penalizes complexity. And that's what we're going to see in, in the next slide. Okay, so we're looking here at the log of the model evidence. And I said that this term is going to penalize complexity. Uh, now, why is that the case? Uh, we can, I think we can safely assume that the width of the posterior will be smaller than that of uh, the prior. Um, and we actually see that really, especially in the overfitting case, uh, the, the width of these posterior distributions or these posterior distributions, they become super sharp, meaning that um, the model is really only satisfied with one particular choice uh, for my model parameters W. And uh, once I deviate from that choice, I no longer have a good fit. So these overfitting solutions are highly unstable. And this, this can be interpreted from the fact that these distributions are, are very small. Um, nevertheless, we can assume that uh, this uh, ratio, so the posterior is smaller than the prior, and that means that I have a fraction, uh, some, some value between zero and one, and that means that the logarithm of this thing will be negative. Okay, so we see some competing forces. So on the one side, so we're optimizing this thing, right? We're trying to maximize this thing. So we really want to maximize uh, the likelihood. Makes sense, we want to be able to model the data. Uh, but this term actually tells us that we actually do not want to make the model too complex or at least not the posterior too small because this thing is negative and the smaller this thing gets, uh, the lower my model evidence uh, will be. Okay, so we can make this notion of complexity penalty more 
concrete by, by thinking about uh, models that we consider more complex, right? If we have uh, a model which depends on a lot of basis functions, so I'm working with feature factors um, or let's say M uh, basis functions, so that will give me M uh, separate weights. And with all of these basis functions, so the larger the M is, the more complex functions I can represent. So M is really um, sort of identical to model complexity in, in some way. Now in this higher dimensional case, my approximations actually rely not on, on these uh, width intervals, but actually on, on small volumes, right? So because in every direction, I'm going to make this approximation. So this will give me a distraction to the power M and this M would then move to the front uh, because of these uh, logarithm rules. Okay, so, uh, so then this approximation, um, Let's just consider the approximation of the model evidence that we did before, like uh, like this uh, approximation. So that tells me I'm computing uh, the likelihood given my uh, map solution for my model times this fraction of uh, the posterior over the prior. But now I'm in this n-dimensional uh, setting, so this to the power m. So really this is a, a volume uh, element. Okay, so and then in the log evidence case, we see that we consider the log of the likelihood my uh, maximum posterior solution for my model plus m times the log of this uh, fraction. Okay, so we already saw that this fraction, we can assume it to be close, uh, smaller than one, so this term will be negative. And now if I go to the higher dimensional case, it will become... A negative more quickly, right? So that means a higher M will result in a higher penalty for my uh, model evidence. Uh, it penalizes complexity in this model evidence. So in that sense, uh, we see that uh, uh, the model evidence favors models of medium complexity because they have to be complex enough to, to optimize uh, my likelihood to, to really be able to describe my data, but it shouldn't be overly complex because then this term starts uh, to dominate. Now, finally, we can gain some deeper understanding in, in, in the model evidence and how it sort of promotes uh, models that are just complex enough by really considering the following thought experiment. So we're considering here three models. Like M1 is really the simplest model. Then I have uh, like a, a medium model and a very complex model. And as it turns out, this simple model can only represent very simple data distributions and the complex model can represent many different types of data distributions. So we can hypothetically generate these data distributions, right, uh, from each of these models. Uh, we could do that in the following way. So we have, for each model, we have a prior for W. So let's just randomly sample one of those priors and then insert this prior in my generative model. So in my predictive distribution and draw data from this. And I keep doing this and doing this. And then for if I do this for the model one, uh, because it isn't so complex, it will not generate a very wide range of distributions. And that is sort of abstractly uh, depicted over here, right? So this horizontal axis represents just uh, some distribution. Um, but the concept is a simple model can only represent a very few uh, of, the, of such, such data distributions, whereas the more complex model can generate a very wide range of distributions. And of course, note that uh, we're talking about uh, data distributions. So these need to be normalized uh, to one, right? So uh, model one in the end generates a distribution which is very narrow, but it's higher, right? So the probability for data uh, distributions within this range is high, whereas for uh, the complex models, it, it is able to generate a lot of different distributions and then the probability for uh, ending up with one particular distribution will have, well, that, that will be a lower probability. Okay, so, and then if we, okay, and so that's a, that's the situation. And now we're going to, we observe some data, uh, some data set, and we want to recover which model might have been uh, the source of this uh, data set. Okay, and th then we see that model one is very unlikely to be the source of this uh, data distribution uh, because, well, the model evidence is, well, it's, it's almost zero here. It's simply because it cannot represent such a data set. And also for the complex model, surely it can represent its data set, but in just looking at this uh, uh, model evidence, it's, 
in that sense, it's less likely than model two uh, because, well, what are the odds that this data set came from all of these options that I have? So you will see that the model uh, that is just complex enough to describe this data set will really have this uh, maximal uh, model evidence because it's normalized uh, over all possible data sets that it can uh, represent. Yeah, and therefore the model that is just complex enough to be able to represent this data will in, in the end have the highest uh, model uh, evidence. Okay, so what I did was I introduced a notion of model evidence and this model evidence is the same as the marginal distribution in which all model parameters are marginalized out. And what I'm left with is this marginal likelihood, uh, which quantifies how likely it is that a particular data set is generated uh, via this uh, model. Now, via some approximation tricks, we gain some intuition on what this model evidence uh, represents. And it, it turns out uh, to be a mix of a likelihood term and a complexity penalty, by which it promotes models that are just complex enough to fit the data. Uh, and I finally, I concluded with this uh, thought experiment, which really confirms that the model evidence tends to prefer models of medium complexity.